Professor Ian, or Professor Ian, uh, welcome to the podcast. It's such an honour to have you on the show. Uh, for those of you who don't know Ian, he is uh, one of the most accomplished clinical psychologists in the world and has an insanely remarkable history and, and one of the most amazing authors as well. So all the good things, uh, we're going to learn a lot about uh, confidence in the brain. And, so, uh, yeah, uh, Ian, welcome. Uh, it's such an honour to have you on. And, um I hear you're in uh, you're in beautiful Dublin. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am indeed. Very <laughs> generous. So I thought, um, yeah, we could start off. I I, I know, um, yeah, you've obviously, you've, I think you've written is it ten ten scientific books and five books for normal people? <laughs> yeah, so I think we're uh, yes, yeah, something like that, and uh, a bunch of scientific papers and nobody reads anymore. So <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> I'm sure they're they're recommended read, reading at all uh, all all practice all hospitals or wherever they wherever they need to read them. <laughs> um, but uh, how did you um, how did you get into this? Did you did you wake up when you were younger and go I definitely want to know more about the brain? Well, I tell you what, there was when I was only a very only people as old as I am will remember this. There was a an ITV uh, series in the. I guess it must be in the 1950s and 60s, called The Human Jungle. And it was a fiction series where the, the protagonist was a psychiatrist in Harley Street. And he had these usually very rich, beautiful people coming to him, but with complicated problems that involved a kind of Sherlock Holmes type unraveling of what was going on. And I loved this and decided I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And then when I was about to apply for university or in my mid-teens, I discovered you had to do medicine and I didn't like blood. So I, I, yeah. I switched to computer science, <laughs> bizarrely, and then was able to transfer to psychology at Glasgow University. And there I never looked back. I just loved the subject and um, have continued to, to be passionate about it. And then I trained as a clinical psychologist at the Institute of Psychiatry in London at the Wadsley and um, under Hans Eisenk and Jack Rachman. And um, there I, I got kind of frustrated after a few years about the lack of connection, the, the lack of the, the fact that clinical practice was didn't seem to be, have a strong enough base in science. And so I started to ask myself how the brain and the mind interact. And in these days, you thought it was mainly a kind of one-way path. One tended to assume that it was genetically determined that the people you saw was largely biological genetic factors. And that turned out to be completely wrong. As with all things, it's as much goes as much the other way as in, you know, so. And, and that was the great revelation of brain plasticity. The papers from Mike Mercenary from San Francisco in the 1980s have shown that the, the brain is physically changed by experience. So that was a revelation for me. And so I ended up doing my PhD on trying to improve brain function in people who had had strokes and head injury. And then I got a very fortunate job in Cambridge with the wonderful Cognition and Brain Sciences unit there. And I spent eight fantastic years as a senior scientist in Cambridge before um, moving over to Dublin to establish the Institute of Neuroscience and the Professor of Psychology here and subsequently some other uh, endeavors, all based on the premise that um, what we, how we organize ourselves, how we interact, what we do, how we think, shapes the physical structure of our brain and hence of our health and well-being and performance. So the move from Cambridge to Dublin had nothing to do with your love of Guinness. Ha. Yeah, well, I like that as well. You know, yeah. you know, Dublin's a fantastic place. It was a real fantastic opportunity and brilliant scientists here. And was able, I was able to, to do things here that, um, you know, spread my wings here in a way it would have been more difficult in Cambridge. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. I know, I think actually you mentioned this in your book, um, the, the difference between... Uh, you know, sort of uh, being a big fish in a in a small pond, or being a, a a small fish in a big big pond. Yeah, that's right. That being said, I wouldn't have missed Cambridge for anything. I mean, just brilliant people there, brilliant lot of people, and fantastically stimulating. So it was a absolutely 
what a privilege to be there for eight years and, and just to, you know, you learn so much and you change, your brain's physically changed by contact with all these brilliant people. You know? it, it is what I, I, I remember, um, had a wonderful chat to um, Dr. Ian McGillcrest and uh, it, was, it was always um, really lovely to know that you, your brain can continually grow and, uh, and evolve. Absolutely. And uh, of course, my current research is about how to, because we have an epidemic of um, dementia across the world, and even more in poor countries than in rich countries. And um, so the idea is now to apply these principles to trying to maintain the brain function to reduce the scale of, of dementia worldwide because there ain't no proper treatments or no readily scalable treatments. So we have to, luckily, we know now some of the principles of how to keep brains fit and somewhat protected against the, the ravages of diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Not completely, it'll never completely pre stop it, but it, it, it builds your resilience to them. Well, good, good luck. I think the, the world needs more of that. I've, uh, yeah, I've seen what dementia can do. It's a, it's a painful thing. I lo loved uh, reading every now and then about different experiences they do, uh, 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 experiments they do, sorry, to try and kill that. I remember reading something, I mean, this is probably old hat for you now, but I remember reading about something like they were giving them as Mario Kart to play or something to help them with spatial awareness and yeah. reading some study saying it helps them. Oh yeah. Or study. The stimulus, I mean, even in someone with dementia, there is still a degree of neuroplasticity. Some learning is possible and, you know, people are, people's well-being and their state of mind and their what they can and cannot do very much depends on what's happening to them and, and the stimulation and the engagement. Um, so things like music and interacting with young children, all of these things produce profound changes or and produce profound changes in behavior. I guess um, I, 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 well, well, I promise we'll change topic in a minute, but I was just, it made me think, um, it, I, I wonder whether this has had a, a, a sort of a more negative effect in certain countries around the world where we tend to we don't tend to live with our grandparents anymore or our parents anymore. We're all in totally different places and cities and, and they're kind of much more, there's much more isolation. I would imagine. Yeah, that's, that's certainly, that's certainly true. And although I remember 40 years ago, oh, in the 1970s living, or I lived in Fiji in the South Pacific and there was a family living in a shanty town that I became very friendly with and I'd go and stay there. Uh, you know, it was kind of, huts made of cardboard and corrugated iron. The old grandmother, I didn't know how to put a name on it now, but I realized then, I realized now she had Alzheimer's, but she just sat in the corner, you know, and nobody really addressed much to her. It was, you know, so she was in her own way. She was, in some ways you could have seen that she'd been in a good nursing home. There would have been people interacting with her, maybe doing stuff with her, but that didn't happen. So it's not, even though it's preferable that people live you know, in communities, it doesn't guarantee the quality of interactions that will keep people engaged. So anyone out there, no need to feel totally guilty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so it's, um, I'd love to move on to your, your amazing book. Um, it's uh, all about confidence. So look behind me here, uh, how confidence works. It's absolutely marvelous. And what I loved about it, absolutely loved about it, is it takes something... Uh, that that could be, I think, quite complex. And you've shared so many amazing stories. I mean, when I was going through it, there were stories. You know, I think you start off with stories from Venus Williams, and then you've got stories about different CEOs, uh, Brexit, golf players, tennis players. There's a uh, there's there's a story to see everyone in there, um, and it just makes it so much more accessible. Uh, you know, I, I I always sort of grew up suffering from dyslexia. I really struggle when people don't tell stories and. This book is full of stories, so thank you for writing it. it is, well, thank you. It's, it's a joy to read, really is. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, the thing about confidence is, you listen to any, in any domain of life, politics, economics, but particularly sport, you will never hear a post or pre-match discussion that doesn't bring up the word confidence a half a dozen times. It's just absolutely central to, to our lives. 
Uh, I um, I hope uh, I hope Ireland and Scotland uh, continue to have confidence in the world. Yeah, I, I somehow one of them's going to have to go. I think South Africa is going to go through. I fear. <laughs> they are doing very well. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess to start off with, I guess what would be your short description of what what confidence is, um, and uh, and and why do we need it? Confidence is above all a belief that is a self fulfilling prophecy. It it creates what it predicts. So it's a state of mind where you believe that you can do something, and that if you do it, a good outcome will follow, and that belief creates a state of the brain that makes it more likely that outcome will happen because the chemical changes in the brain, particularly in the reward network, the dopamine system, creates a brain that's more bold, less depressed, more you know, less anxious, m- more motivated and ready for action, and slightly smarter. Um, and so uh, it, it is really our, the, the fuel that gets us across this this bridge to the future. Human beings are the only species that can imagine things of the world that don't exist yet and work towards creating them. And confidence is what gets them to cross that bridge. And it's not optimism. Optimism is a sunny belief that things will turn out. It's not self-esteem. That's the your self-evaluation. Uh, what it is, the secret sauce of confidence is the fact that it's so closely linked to action, to taking action. It's your belief that you can do a particular thing both in the inside world and the internal world and in the external. So it's, it's uh, is it sort of sounds like it's a bit, it can be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's right. I mean, one of uh, the greatest corrosive of confidence is anxiety. And the greatest antidote to anxiety is confidence. And the thing about anxiety is anxiety activates the, the threat perception systems of the brain, the avoidance systems. So it makes you pull back because you're anticipating punishment or negative outcomes. And so across the world, we know that people who are chronically anxious do less of everything. They do less stuff. They, they exhibit fewer behaviors because they're, they're frightened. They're, they're, they're motivated by fear. That means uh, the great Afghanistani poet, uh, philosopher Rumi, said the road only appears with the first step. So if you're not taking first steps... You're not seeing roads that are going to lead to perceptions and opportunities and encounters and sheer good fortune that comes from moving forward, even though you're moving forward without knowing precisely where you're going. And that's what confidence does. It moves you forward. How do you, how do you then uh, become less anxious and <laughs> more confident? Say that again. So how do you become less anxious and more confident? I guess? Well... Just give, I'll give you one example. Um, is to anxiety, anxiety. Well, you were talking about rugby earlier. So, a couple of years ago, I was um, sitting at home on a Saturday afternoon, and I my stomach was twisting and my pulse was racing and my hands were sweaty. And so, if I ask you what what emotion do you think I was having, most people will say anxiety. Fear. But no, I was excited because it was a rare occasion there. Scotland was beating England at rugby. <laughs> so I was bringing it up. <laughs> well, here's the, so here's the question. How do you distinguish, how do you know what emotion you're having if the symptoms of excitement are exactly the same as those of anxiety? You only know what emotion you're having by the label you put on it. And we know that someone who's in a high anxiety performance situation who says to themselves, I feel anxious rightly before they do the task versus someone who says, I feel excited and they both have the same symptoms. Just saying that word makes you, makes you perform better. Why? Because you're, you're changing the emotion by cognitive jujitsu. <laughs> the emotion only exists as a diffuse propensity for action. That all, that's all arousal is, is a propensity to act, either fight or flight or celebrate. And you, when you apply that mental framework to it to say, this, this is me, this is excitement, 
So suddenly the thing that was causing you fear and causing you to think of all the negative things that can happen, suddenly you're seeing an opportunity to perform a challenge, to face a challenge. That's the challenger mindset. That activates different brain circuits to those that act are activated in fear and threat perception. And they, 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 these, I am excited, if you like, the challenge circuits actually inhibit the fear ones. So the best, so that's why the best way to overcome anxiety is to do the thing you're anxious about in spite of the anxiety and not to be frightened of the fear. So it, it is a kind of courage. And that's what courage is, is doing stuff not because you're not frightened, but in spite of the fear. And taking action in spite of fear is one of the greatest sources of confidence. And the more you do that, the more you will feel more in control of your fear rather than under under control of it. I guess it's kind of also learning to get very comfortable with failure. Well, that's critical. Um, failure is an amazing teacher. It's a much better teacher than success. Um, but the trouble is, we just as we tend to run away from fear, we also tend to run away from uh, failure. Because we tend to think big thoughts about failure, I am no use, I am humiliated, I am this or I am that. And these are big entrapping thoughts that paralyze you. Um, and Whereas if you can dissect failure and say, okay, that's interesting, failure is an amazing teaching signal, let me understand why I failed. You know, what, what was it was going on to make me fail? And if you do that, you will, uh, and that involves a different set of thoughts. You, 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 you get rid of all these big, try to draw big conclusions about you and your yourself and your ego and rather say, well, what were the circumstances? What did I not do? What did I do? What did someone else do? What did they not do? What were the circumstances? And if you do that, doing a kind of post-mortem of the failure, as an incredible teacher, and doing that will give you a sense of control and help you embrace failure. If you do that, and then allow yourself to transcend the anxiety that came from the failure by doing the thing again, you will be more likely to do it. As long as you set yourself, don't set yourself huge goals, set yourself goals that are in the sweet spot of neither too easy nor too hard, but stretch you a little bit. And these will be different for different people. Sometimes for someone just walking 10 yards out the front door is, a, is an amazing goal for them that, that challenges them. For other people, it be much higher goal. doesn't matter. It's all individually focused. So that's where this goals and action and uh, responding to failure are all critical ingredients in building confidence. It's marvelous advice. And um, I, another sort of question is that I wondered whether is... Is there a relation? Is there a relationship between uh, maybe? The, and apologies if this is a silly question. Uh, um, introversion and extroversion. Yes, it's not a silly question. It's not a silly question at all. Extroverts do more stuff. Extra means outside. Extroverts are more likely to speak out in the in the room where no one's talking. Um, so extroverts are more in approach mode and less in avoidant mode. It's not saying that everything is rosy, but there are huge advent advantages also of being an introvert because you can be more reflective and sometimes avoid the traps of impulsiveness or, or you know, you're not as, maybe not as dependent on other people's approval. But uh, yes, it, it, this um, confidence is linked to this kind of outgoing, uh, this, this kind of dominance uh, in a primitive way. And that's why men have an advantage over women. Uh, in, in, in confidence. But the thing is that confidence is not just these brash outward tokens of confidence. There is There can be a steely internal uh, confidence, your belief that you can do stuff that may be very, very quietly expressed. And sometimes that can be much more powerful um, because it's, it's because people are surprised by it. So, and one of the, so, so an introvert can be very, very confident and um, particularly if they're strongly grounded in their values, 
if you know what you stand for and you have your values and you articulate them, then the quietly spoken, not doing very much person could have a much, can sometimes have a much bigger impact on a group of people than the, than the more loud, outward, charismatic, brash person. So confidence is, shouldn't be confused with extroversion, but it does. Ex, be, extroverts have a, a bit of an advantage in, in in the superficialities of confidence, just as men can have vis-a-vis women. And and is that? Um, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned that the the difference between men and men and women is that. Is there a reason for that? Is that just some evolutionary thing, or is there chemical, different chemical make? Well, there's no doubt about it that um, testosterone plays a part. Uh, there is a, I mean, testosterone is correlated with certain type of narcissism. Um, you know, but even you, you can have, I mean, a certain type of a narcissism is can be important. Nobody would stand for elected office if they weren't a little bit narcissistic. So narcissism narcissism is not always all bad. And, and it goes with this kind of extrovert, uh, dominant dominant kind of personality, which again needn't be bad. It can be good as well. Um, and yes, that has been shown to be correlated with testosterone levels. And of course, women have significantly lower baseline levels of testosterone than men. Um, so the, the boys and girls start off with this kind of difference, but as with all these genetic or biological differences, they are quite sm- have quite small effects on your behavior, all other things being equal. The problem is in the world, all other things are not equal. And these small advantages get amplified. Success breeds success. The more a person becomes more dominant, and as a result, that squishes down and, and, and you know, creates um, withdrawal or, or, or more submissive behavior in the person who's having to encounter this dominant person. So, so these things, the environment, the social and cultural environment, either amplifies or minimizes these, these if you like, genetic uh, differences. And there are huge cross national differences in con- in the confidence gap between men and women. It is, for instance, much less in North America than it is in Scotland or Ireland. England's a bit m- somewhere in between. Still still quite significant in England. Um so uh culture just how 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 cultures respond to sex differences is a huge effect on whether whether this confidence deficit will be allowed to mushroom or not. Wow, that's amazing. So I, I never thought about that. It, it makes a lot of sense that you've, you mentioned there as well that different countries have different com- general confidence levels. Uh, well, g- general confidence, yes, confidence levels, but also con- confidence is gaps. You know, the rich the rich and privileged of any country will be always be supremely confident. <laughs> Are, are the Americans always very confident? I kind of, well, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I wish, I wish uh, sometimes we had more confidence in the UK. You know, and, and you know what? Um, you know, we sometimes critically or critic criticize Americans, you know, for being loud and all that. But they do learn that in their education system, um, not to be self-deprecating. <laughs> you know, we, we kind of like the self-deprecating humor talking. You know, this is always kind of defending us up, but. That kind of self-deprecation can have its costs, you know, on our on our self-confidence. Sometimes it's better not to be self-deprecating, to bite back the the, the kind of oh, this is probably rubbish. But these little verbal ticks that serve to ward off the fear of criticism actually make us less confident, and more importantly, make other people less confident than us. So if you're if you're a you know. I've got a new company and you're pitching to venture capitalists via startup. You know, the last thing you want to do is, oh, this is probably rubbish, but <laughs> they don't want to hear that. They want to say, I, I firmly, this is an incredibly important concept. I believe it's going to work. Here's what <laughs> you have to. And that's, that's the thing about confidence expressed, even though there may be internal doubt, if you express it in, externally as a, as a social message, it buys you status. And if it buys you status, that will then reflect itself in increasing your confidence because other people will accord you status. So it is a 
that's another way in which confidence is a self-fulfilling prophecy because it makes you more persuasive and, 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 and give you a higher status. You're muted. Hi, sorry. I was reading in the book, you, uh, you mentioned the Easterlin paradox, uh, which I think was, um, uh, you know, that is it, uh, is it sort of the more, the more happy you are, the more wealthy you are, or is, is this the same with confidence? Is it the more, the more confident you are, the more successful you are, or the more successful you are, the more confident you are? Well, yes, both are true. Both are true. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. It's big American social mobility studies when they look at who moved. When people move from smaller towns and rural areas to the big cities, they tend to become richer. You know, Dick Whittington is the Dick Whittington story. Um, and when you ask, when you look at who moves, it's not the brightest, not the smartest IQ wise that move, it's the more confident. <laughs> And that confidence, uh, that confidence, takes them, allows them to take that step into the unknown that leaving your hometown involves, and maybe not knowing what you're going to do, but you know your path appears with the first step, and confidence allows you to take that first. step. Where, where do you think you you fit on a level of like uh, sort of confidence, super confident? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, I I grew up as a a working class in the council house in Glasgow. I was very fortunate to to, to grow up in the post-war uh, welfare policies that meant you got grants to go to university. Uh, it, the social mobility was high in these days. I'm a ab- exemplar of social mobility. I was very under unconfident, very aware of my class status vis-a-vis friends when I was in the Sea Scouts and Friends of the Sea Scouts who come from came from private houses, and I was very aware of that, and slightly ashamed of my very modest council house, and um, uh, uh, and very you know not lacking social confidence a lot. I had quite reasonable academic confidence. I was fortunate to go to a really good school, again not fee paying, um, and and but the the thing is, and so I so now having with all the privileges of that education. And the success, breeding success, I'm now pretty confident. I'm pretty confident in most situations. But, I mean, singing a choir, ask me to, to sing solo in front of an audience, I'd, I'd be, I, the last thing I'd be as confident, I couldn't do it. So, so these things are domain specific, you know, and, and I wouldn't be that confident, you know, I don't go out and blow everyone away at a party. I'm, I'm quite kind of stuck in the stuck in the kitchen, you know, pers- kind of person at the party, usually less depending on how much you have to drink. But that's, um, so, 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 so confidence is learnable. It's hugely influenced by your career, your, your social status. And that social, that per- how you perceive your social status directly affects the, the, the density of the dopamine receptors in your brain's reward network. So, your social class or your perceived social class it changes the biology of your brain in ways so the lower the lower your perceived social class, the lower your mood, the lower your motivation, the higher your anxiety, the lower your quality of life. These social social status has these profound effects on the biology of the brain and and, and creates the behaviors that you assume are, 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 if you like, biologically determined. They're not. They're not, bi- they're not largely biologically determined. They're largely determined by the social, the social gradient that you perceive yourself to be on. Now, there's one wonderful antidote to that, and that is people who are, who are objectively at a very low social status and see themselves as having a low so- social status. Otherwise, they'll have low mood, uh, higher illnesses, live, die, die sooner, except if they have a sense of control, if they perceive that they have a degree of control over their lives, perhaps via family relationships, via their community, but that is a huge antidote to the negative effects of perceived social status on the brain's biology uh, and confidence. And, and control, of course, 
is the twin sister of confidence. Confidence makes you feel more in control, both of the external world, but also of the internal world of your own emotions. That's amazing. And um, it, does that sort of help explain it? And I'm not too sure whether this is this tracks elsewhere in the world, but I know certainly in the UK, there's a sort of a general, uh, a general feeling that people who go to private school tend to be much more confident than uh, than, than people who go to state schools. Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. You're that really. Yes, you're getting good education. There'll be good education in public and private school and uh, state schools as well. You're essentially buy, you're buying two things when you send your kid to a public school. One is contact, and the other is confidence. CC. <laughs> I mean that, and that 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 confidence is just I cannot I cannot exaggerate what a, a beneficial resource it is. <laughs> it just is like a magic. Elixir, and um, you know, I remember when I started uh, in one of the courses I did, and there was someone from, uh, and I, I, reasonable degree from Glasgow University. I wasn't, you know, a double first or anything. And and uh, I remember there was a colleague, a nice, it turned out to be a nice lad, but he was from Oxford, <laughs> very confident, outward spoken spoke up all the time and came with a first from Oxford and all that. And I remember just being feeling diminished and and kind of inferior. And after about two months, I realized that I was smarter than him, you know. And and, and not that he was malign in any way. It was, this, it was the superficialities that he had learned. And he wasn't, he was actually a really nice guy that I became friendly with. But these superficialities intimidated and and if you, and if I'd been a a girl from Glasgow, I would have been trebly intimidated by this and, and inhibited, and and wouldn't have experienced the the huge kind of increase in confidence that comes from going to, in a brilliant institution, educational institution, where you're meeting brilliant people and you, you're able to test yourself. That wonderful environment. Um. So so these these um. You know, I'm not saying, I mean, look, Oxford and Cambridge, I, I, I worked in Cambridge, they're wonderful places, brilliant people, but your average student from Cambridge, it's fine. <laughs> but so is your average student from Glasgow or Leeds or Liverpool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but what you get in Oxford and Cambridge, you know, at, at particularly in public schools, is, is the confidence. Uh, and that's worth, worth three times an IQ, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just so, it's so interesting you say that. I mean, I, I wonder whether can you could you speak to the education secretary and the, get them to 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 do classes on confidence. I mean, it sounds like that. Yeah, you know, there there are lots of things we don't learn in school that I think are very valuable to, yeah. to people in their lives, and it's sort of yeah. yeah well, look, confidence. If you, it, to you, if you give a child confidence, if you give a child confidence, you're 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 setting them up for life. And the the, the trouble is the. The two biggest, two of the big, two of the biggest determinants of confidence are your social class and your, your gender, your sex. You know, these are the two. Also, physical stature and physical appearance are very important as well. Um, but all all of these things, none of them are inevitable. <laughs> they're all they're all there to to play for because the real the real test of confidence is can you do it. And particularly, can you do it in spite of adversity? Because doing stuff in spite of adversity and doing it in spite of the anxiety that adversity causes gives a much tougher and more robust confidence. We know that children, for instance, who have and young ad- and children and adolescents who have blessed know nothing but success in their lives. Uh, best at sport, popular, good academically. We know that they end up, on average, more emotionally vulnerable as young, as young adults than children and adolescents who have had some adversity. Not big, not huge amounts. There's a sweet spot of adversity that gives you a kind of emotional resilience because it's like being vaccinated. It's like emotional vaccination. And for example, children who have a Saturday job end up more emotionally robust as young adults and children who don't. Because having a Saturday job 
you're rubbing up. There's not everyone's going to be treating you as well and as nicely as you you've been used to in your protected um, uh, place. So that's that's why you know team sports and involvement in groups and uh, things like I was in the Sea Scouts and the Scouts, you know, things like that. Really important and rubbing up against people and and learning. Uh, you know, not everything is sweet. Not everyone thinks you're wonderful. Yes, you, sometimes horrible things happen to you and, and you get your mood goes down and you feel anxious, but you, you don't treat that as a big disaster. You say, well, yeah, I'm anxious and I'm fed up and that crowd rejected me. Um, you know, co- co- confidence, if you treat these things properly, confidence builds and makes you a tougher, tougher person. I guess in the schooling context, it probably would maybe work the same with boarding versus day. As though when you're boarding, you, you, you're you taken out of your, your little comfort zone with yeah. your parents. You're sort of forced in with a whole load of other people. And it's, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's the case. As long as, long as it doesn't get... You know how sometimes you can get uh, to uh, unhealthy environments can develop, and you know if you don't have the protection of an alternative, right? And then one too much adversity there either. Too much adversity or systematic bullying or stuff like that. That's the that's the challenge. But yeah, if you you know some some people really just find themselves thriving, um, you know, in that in that kind of context where they're, they're not able just to run back to the protection of mommy and daddy. Yes, I, mean, I mean, confidence so is, it, you know, when I, before I read the book, whenever I was thinking about it, I'd, I'd often think about politics would probably be the, the space I'd go to immediately. And it's uh, and you see the sort of dangers maybe have been overcome. Yeah, yeah. That is, that, that's the thing about confidence. It's this strange two-edged sword, um, you know, uh, that that it makes you more successful, and success is the greatest source of success. So it can, and it's like compound interest. So a confident person can can end up with huge status and and all the resources, wealth and rank, and other things that go with status. And um, that when that becomes too much, that can go to people's head. And 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 the. Uh, in politics, it without the constraints of good governance, free press, independent judiciary, elections, um, regulations and rules. If you don't have these, then it's almost, it's almost there's almost a totally predictable path that ninety five percent of people put in that position of having unfettered power engage in, which is the kind of ghastly hubris and, and, and pathological narcissism of people like Putin and Trump and Kim Jong-un and, and the other dictators who are rising up, unfortunately, in the world at this, this moment. This is an entirely predictable effects of unfettered power in the brain because power is the greatest brain changer and it power leads to a kind of pathological co- overconfidence. And so you get, <laughs> you know, Hitler, I mean, it's terrible to invoke Hitler, but Hitler and Napoleon both had such successes and the power went to their heads so much that they both committed the folly of invaded, invading Russia and that both brought them both down. And Putin's done exactly the same in Ukraine. Um, so over, overconfidence is a, is a trap and you get it and a less dramatic form and you know very successful CEOs for example very successful celebrities that they get the, 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 the so much success tilts the balance between approach and avoidance in their brain between challenge and threat that their self-awareness diminishes their empathy diminishes um, their perception of risk diminishes and their judgment gets scrambled and they do silly bizarre things that's good to know. And so I hope just like uh, you can learn to be confident, maybe they can learn to be slightly less confident. Um, I'm guessing well, that's that lovely. More adversity or something they need. Well, that's why, that's why we need elections and free presses and free journalism, you know. And, um, if, if, and that's why these people try and systematically, the first things they try and dismantle 
look at Netanyahu in Israel just now, try and dismantle the, the independent judiciary, uh, try and dismantle, you know, other people try and dismantle the free press because um, A, it's a threat to your ego, B, it's a threat to your freedom. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, so these people are not voluntary. So it's, it's like it's like addiction. It's very, very similar to addiction to alcohol or drugs. Generally, once you get addicted, it's very people seldom kind of just voluntarily give it up. Usually, they have to really hit the buffers in some way to suddenly bring an awareness to themselves of the the damage they're causing to themselves and others. But if you're a powerful leader, you can. You can change the world so that you're immune to the, that damage. I mean, how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people has Putin killed? But he's immune to these effects. No one, who's going to speak truth to power in Russia? He'll end up coming out a window. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the real risk. Um, and then, you know, if you're a CEO of a successful company, if you're managing to, to, to woo the markets with your confidence, I'm thinking of we work here in Adam. Um, I can't remember his second name, but anyway, we were the famous uh, collapse of WeWork. It was based on his charisma and his con overconfidence, which was actually not not based on on reality. And, and so that these kind of commercial co realities can pull people down. But politics, you can have a secret service. You can be Maduro in in, in Venezuela. You can just keep things going because you have technology to control millions of people. And your, you know, control of the army, etc. So, it's a, it's, it's a very, very, it's one of the biggest challenges to the world is is how individual leaders become intoxicated with power, and the abs and the the, the the loss of faith in democracy, and democratic pr processes, um, is 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 hugely worrying because these are the the things that constrain power, and of course we you know we just have to think of Xi in China and just shake our heads that, you know, even the Chinese used to change their government every 10 years because they, they knew the power after 10 years does terrible things to people and now he's changed the rules, so he's staying on, you know, probably for life, you know. Yes, incredible. I mean, I, I, I know uh, we're running out of time, but um, would, would there be uh, any sort of uh, final tips you'd leave on, uh, on, on confidence? Um, to, to, to find that right balance, yeah. I guess. Just, I'd say, as someone who knows what it's like not to be confident, is to, it, 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 is to really get into your mind that you can say to yourself, I can do this. And that the, this, what that this is, is important. So realize that just talking to yourself is not going to make you more confident. But taking action in the world and just taking that the first step that Rumi talks about and take a step for the sake of it without even knowing necessarily where that's taking you. Get into the habit of taking steps in spite of these doubts, in spite of that anxiety. And gradually get into the habit of setting goals for yourself that stretch you a bit, that cause you a bit of anxiety, and do it in spite of that, in spite of yourself. And if you do that regularly, you will steadily build your confidence. Absolutely incredible advice. So uh, for anyone listening, we, we wish you all the best with that. And uh, the, the best tip would uh, would be to uh, to go and get your book. <laughs> so, absolutely. That's the first of all. Yeah, no. Look, uh, it, 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 available at all good bookstores uh, online and in and in the real world. Uh, How confidence works by Ian Robertson. And if you want to look up more about, uh, find out more about Ian and get in contact, he's got a marvelous website as well. It's uh, ianrobertson dot org. Um, if I got that right, um, and uh, it's a wealth of information on there as well. And there's uh, lots of incredible stories about Ian. And yeah, it's. Uh, it's just been such an honor to chat with you today and, and, and thank you so, so much for sharing so, so many incredible tips. And uh, um, I, yeah, what an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. We really, uh, really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks.